A haze on the far horizon, the infinite tender sky, and the ripe tints of the cornfields, and the wild birds sailing by. Situated between the two northern archipelagos of Orkney and Shetland is Fair Isle. It has two lighthouses, one at either end of the island, and both constructed by the Stevenson brothers in 1892. According to a list of shipwrecks compiled by a native of Fair Isle, these lighthouses were desperately required. The record names over 50 vessels that were lost around these shores in the 200-year period up till 1937. The island's coastline is rocky and precipitous. Although there are crofts, the soil is generally quite poor with very little grazing land. Perhaps that's why sheep were once grazed here on Sheep Rock. Apparently, the men climbed it with the aid of chains and used ropes to raise and lower their flock. Safe to say that they must have been a hardy bunch, man and beast. Today's Fair Isle community is pretty secure, although just 50 years ago, it was feared that the island would be depopulated. Ornithologist George Watterson went some way to preventing this by establishing a bird observatory here in 1948. Fair Isle is now in the care of the National Trust. The island is renowned for its exceptional bird life. More species have been recorded here than anywhere else in Britain. The ferry Good Shepherd sails from North Haven on the east side to mainland Shetland, weather permitting, of course. Although this small harbour is sheltered, the waters beyond can often be treacherous. The north of Fair Isle, where the rock stacks are at their highest and the population at its lowest. Despite the reassurance provided nowadays by the lighthouse, just ask any sailor and they'll tell you that Fair Isle is by no means easily accessible, although it's well worth the effort. The best approach to Shetland is by air. For those flying in from Orkney, the first sight of mainland Shetland is Sumbra Head and the lighthouse at the tip of this famous promontory. It's a pretty impressive sight. Close to Sambra Airport is one of the region's most significant archaeological sites. It was discovered, as was Scarabray in Orkney, after severe storms swept away the sand that had hidden it for so long. Here in Jarlsov, 3,000 years of history are contained in just one site. There are huts dating from the Bronze Age, earth houses from the Iron Age, a broch and wheel houses from the 1st to the 8th centuries. A variety of Norse longhouse remains from the 9th century, the foundations of a medieval farmhouse, and, as if that weren't enough, the walls of a 16th century dwelling. Across the sound from mainland is the small island of Musa. It's uninhabited today. Musa does attract plenty of visitors, however, many of whom are keen to view its Iron Age fort. It's remained unchanged since it was erected over 2,000 years ago. And the seals evidently favour this island also. 
On a warm summer's day, it's quite common to see more than a hundred of them basking in the sun around the tidal pools. At the southernmost tip of mainland Shetland is the promontory known as Fitful Head. It was near here that the Brayer oil tanker disaster occurred in 1993. In total, around 100 separate islands make up the archipelago of the Shetland Isles. Many of them are very unusually shaped. This is Colsey. St Ninian's Isle, the island that isn't quite an island, as it were. The remains of a 12th century chapel can be found here, but in 1958, an excavation revealed the remains of an earlier church and a hoard of 8th century Celtic silver. Proof once more that in historical terms at least, each and every island has its own riches. It was here on the island of South Havre that the magistrate of all Shetland lived in the 16th century. Today, there is little of note to be found other than a windmill where corn was ground in the 19th century. There were eight families living in South Havre up until 1923. It's interesting to note exactly where they lived on the very periphery of the island. This was apparently because they wanted to work the fertile ground here to its fullest potential. Southwest mainland and the islands. Mainland is now connected by bridges with the long, narrow isles of Trondra, Westbara, and Eastbara. And this bridge takes us to Hamnavo. It's an attractive little fishing village, and rather successful too in its own right. It's truly fascinating to note the great differences between the Shetland and Orkney Isles. Of course, they all lie to the far north, but other Scots often forget that they are closer to Bergen than Aberdeen. Galloway was Shetland's capital until around 200 years ago. Today, it's still a significant little fishing port. The pier was built in the 1830s, at a time when large quantities of salt cod were being exported from here to Spain. In the heart of the town is Earl Patrick's castle, built by Earl Patrick Stewart at the beginning of the 17th century. There's good shelter in this harbour. The three islands of Trondra and East and West Barra protect the town from the Atlantic winds. Due to their exposed northerly situation, strong winds can often be a hindrance to daily life in the Shetland Isles. But those winds can also be put to good use. Wind generators like these are located throughout the region.
West Mainland has many lochs and pools, but more interestingly, the area is dotted with prehistoric cairns. These are very different in appearance from those found in the Orkney Isles. of mainland is the island known as Papas Tower. It's thought to have been inhabited as early as 3000 BC. Research conducted in the 1980s also concluded that Duke Hakon had his residence here in the 13th century, before he became King of Norway. Papas Tower is a very fertile island. It's said that fishermen can locate the island in a summer mist by the pungent smell of its wild flowers. But the lack of peat contributed to a serious decline in population at one time, so much so that ads were placed in exchange on Mart, inviting people to come and live on the island. A croft and five head of sheep were offered as incentive, and it worked. They came from all over the UK in search of the good life, and Papa Stour was soon known locally as the Hippie Isle. Impressive stacks and rocks line the coasts. According to the Victorian travel writer John Tudor, its caves are pretty unique too. He noted, there are caves and caves, but probably none in the British Isles, which excel those this little isle can show in weird, fantastic outline and rich colouring combined. 